hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. I'm just uh, transplanting some spare multi-sown beetroot into this perennial vegetable bed. Now something that I've been requested time and time again is how to deal with pests and diseases in the small scale home scale vegetable garden and so in this video I'm going to be covering that the method that I use in this garden to really keep problems down. Something that I very much believe in when I'm in the garden and I see an issue be it pest or disease is that I feel it's essential to look at the root cause of that rather than just trying to treat the symptoms. For example, I've got a bit of slug damage on this Kailan 60 day kale. And if I was just trying to treat the symptoms, I'd put down a few slug traps, which would be effective in the short term, but it isn't gonna make that much of a difference in the long term. With slugs, I really like to look at the root cause. And that is often where you have a habitat that encourages slugs uh, to hide and thrive in, whether it's long grass around the garden or bits like planks to hide underneath. So I've actually had a much bigger focus on making this garden less slug friendly and as a result the damage has been minimal which is why I was quite surprised actually uh, to see this damage today and if you want to find out more about zero cost slug control then definitely check out this video. In this video I'm going to place pests and disease in the same group because what I'll be discussing can actually be applied uh, to both be it carrot root fly or potato blight and I garden using techniques and principles based on permaculture and permaculture is a design system that's inspired by nature now every single garden is going to be different it has its own characteristics but permaculture gives you kind of that groundwork a framework uh, for which you can build upon uh, to make your garden as sustainable and resilient and nature friendly as possible in nature when you have a diverse and thriving ecosystem it's rare to see pests or diseases wreak havoc yes these baddies do exist but it's important that they do because they help to keep nature's immunity strong and should something go bad then nature is remarkably efficient at healing itself in this vegetable garden, I'm trying to emulate nature as much as practically possible when it comes to controlling and more importantly, preventing pest and disease issues. And there's a term that I call it's intensive diversity rather than intensive growing. And it's simply an umbrella term for all of the growing techniques that promote diversity. For example, intercropping, polyculture, succession planting, companion planting, and also growing ornamentals amongst edibles. How does the principle of diversity in nature work as a really effective pest and disease control? Well, to understand that, we need to look at the opposite of diversity, which is monoculture. Monoculture is where you have just one plant or limited plants growing, such as a field of wheat or a huge single species forest of pines. This is block planting and it makes it very easy for a pest or disease to quickly work through the crop because it's a biological desert. There isn't a thriving ecosystem there to defend against the bad guys. Monoculture is a highly vulnerable way of producing food because there isn't the ecosystem there to naturally defend and control pest and disease spread and populations which is why industrial farmers have to rely on pesticides, fungicides and herbicides to get a crop. And this is quite literally the opposite of nature. Just as a quick side note, I don't want you to take diversity as an all or nothing method. I try and take a really pragmatic approach when it comes to pest and disease control in the garden. And sometimes things make more sense to me. So I'm growing carrots here under a mesh to protect them from carrot root fly. And I'd much rather grow carrots this way because it's easier and more efficient than trying to grow carrots in and amongst 
other vegetables and ultimately it's down to you understanding the specific characteristics of your garden and how it reacts to pests and diseases um, to then decide on how to best tackle it and this is a very easy non-invasive method and diversity can be seen as this umbrella method of looking after the garden as a whole ecosystem. But with polyculture, you have a lot of different plants and potentially animals in a small space. And this does two really important things. The first thing is that it makes it harder for the pest or disease to find the plant that it desires. And secondly, it slows down the spread of the pest or disease as well. Think of diversity as a method of disrupting and confusing the bad guys. Now, of course, us vegetable gardeners aren't massive monoculture farms, but there are a few simple things that we can do to make our vegetable gardens even less attractive to pests and diseases. Now the first thing we need to understand is that nature works on balance and when you create a new garden you're effectively creating a new habitat and it can take some time to create a natural pest predator balance usually around three years and with further wildlife habitat creation it can really help promote that so for example if you've just created a new garden there might be a bit of imbalance so don't give up just yet the first tip is to introduce more intercropping and polyculture planting into your garden where it makes sense for you. I don't do it for all of the beds, for example, for the potatoes or the leeks, but sometimes I like to have a mix of things. I've got beans, uh, courgette, radish, leeks, swedes, um, all in this single bed. And the great thing is that it has that natural aesthetic to try and encourage the predators to come in, um, but also it just makes it a little less uh, desirable and a bit more confusing uh, for pests and diseases. Something that you can do as a really quick fix if perhaps you don't feel there's enough diversity around is to grow things like flowers or even herbs in pots and containers like this old watering can has calendula and then you can place this in the middle of raised beds just to add a bit of variation. The second tip is to wildlife up your garden a bit. So this autumn and winter, do a bit of research into what kind of predators, beneficial predators you want to introduce to your garden and look at what kind of habitats they want. For example, you might want to create a bit of a water feature to try and encourage frogs and toads into the garden or allow a bit to go wild. For example, here I've got a lot of nettles for the ladybirds to help control the aphids. Um, and as a result, we also have a lot of butterflies because of that. For example, the peacock, which then helps um, with the pollination. The third tip is to grow more flowers in the garden, especially when it comes to dealing with pests. They serve so many uses. For example, nasturtiums are great sacrificial flowers to grow um, against cabbage white butterflies. You can also grow flowers in the mint and daisy family to try and bring in parasitic wasps. And you can also grow things like lavender to confuse aphids. But ultimately, I wouldn't worry too much about what specific flowers do. Again, if you just grow diversity of different flowers, it's going to contribute a great deal to the overall resilience of your garden. The fourth tip is to only crop rotate when necessary, especially if you're using a lot of polycultures and also succession planting. If you think about it, rotation doesn't really happen in nature, but succession does. And I'd like to apply that to the garden. I'll only rotate if I get a disease issue, for example, if my alliums got rust, or if I had a soil-borne pest issue, for example, if the carrots got carrot root fly. But apart from that, I don't bother. The fifth tip, and perhaps the most important, is to respect our soil and, where possible, to follow no-dig gardening. In fact, this garden is around about 95% no-dig, and no-dig works because it copies what happens in nature. Organic matter, or hummus, is added to the surface of the soil, and we let natural processes bring it down into the soil food web. And by not digging, we're not disturbing the vital mycelium and microorganism networks that work under and live under the ground that supply nutrients to plants, but also help keep down on pests and keep them healthy. 
And there's a saying, I can't quite remember where I saw it, but we should focus on growing soil, not growing plants. If we have healthy soil, we'll have healthy plants. And that will make a huge positive step forward to help your garden become more resilient. Ultimately, if we make our garden as diverse as possible, then nature is going to play a significant role in reducing and preventing pest and disease issues. But a garden isn't 100% nature, and should a problem arise, usually we'll just have simple systems to overcome that. For example, placing some netting over the strawberries to protect them from birds, or by choosing blight-resistant potato varieties. If you're interested in getting two extra exclusive videos every single week, check out my Patreon page where I share a lot more about the garden and the behind the scenes. And thank you very much for watching. I'd love to hear any questions or comments or points of view you have about this video, or perhaps you have your own ideas that you found to be very effective. And I look forward to seeing you again next Saturday. Goodbye.